呢四间金铺就系班歹徒嘅目标。根据高秋嘅线报，佢哋有同样嘅特点，就系、是、有好多贵重嘅金饰，守卫能力弱，路人多，山水容易。Tonight we're going to be talking about Ringo Lam's City on Fire. This crime drama is primarily known for two reasons, but deserves to be explored on its own. The first reason is that City on Fire famously inspired Quentin Tarantino when he was writing Reservoir Dogs. There's a whole story about this Hong Kong movie, City on Fire. If you've ever seen City on Fire, it's very, very different from my movie. The section that they say I took, I did take from it. All right, absolutely, I took from it. But it's a very different movie. They actually talked to the director Ringo Lam. He goes, "Wow, Tarantino took the last ten minutes of my movie, made an entire movie about it." However, I think this comparison gets overplayed. <laughs> City on Fire and Reservoir Dogs are very different movies when you look at them in their entirety. Basically, what Tarantino did is take the last ten minutes, including the Mexican standoff, and explore the relationship dynamics between the characters in a ninety-nine-minute story of its own. That's your proof. You don't need proof when you have instinct. I ignored it before, but no more. You lost your fucking mind. You're making a terrible mistake. I'm not gonna let you make. It. Come on, guys! Nobody wants this. But City on Fire isn't necessarily a story about a single heist. It's a film about an undercover police informant named Ko Chow who works for his uncle. Definitely a conflict of interest. Wong So, you're such a big fool. Ko Chow is a thief. He's a thief. After trying repeatedly to get out of the police business. Following the betrayal of one of his friends, Chow agrees to help out with one last job. 上次成嗰单 case 咪同你讲得好清楚咯，我唔想再做卧底线人啊嘛。你放肆我拉成哥有咩唔妥啊？我要出卖朋友、啊，嗰、那个成哥系社会嘅人渣，条灰放贵你，你知唔知我害死咗几多人啊 ？The final job is to go undercover to infiltrate a gang of jewelry thieves who are suspected in the murder of another undercover officer. And here you can see traces of Tim Roth's Mr. Orange character in Reservoir Dogs. Chow Young Fat plays Ko Chow. Which sets up the second thing City on Fire is known for. After being in John Woo's A Better Tomorrow, Chow Young Fat's role in this movie made him into a huge star in Hong Kong, and it is an extremely juicy role. Stop! Ah! Go! 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 I don't like you. Stop! 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 Hook your chow guy! You don't trust me. Don't give me a call. From here, he would be in a string of heroic bloodshed films. Including the Prison on Fire series and John Woo's Hard Boiled. In the mid '90s, he unsuccessfully tried to make it in Hollywood before landing the starring role in Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon in 2000. Okay. 
，白痴，怎么？那剑就没用了。Also starring in City on Fire is Danny Lee in the role as Fu, a gang member in the jewelry heist group. Fu is a big departure for Danny Lee, who is best known for his roles throughout Hong Kong cinema as various police officers. Two years later, Chow Yun Fat and Danny Lee would reunite in John Woo's *The Killer*. <laughs> Fu is the Mr. White. Harvey Keitel character who brings Chow in. Another big part of the story is that Chow's uncle, Inspector Lau, is becoming old and irrelevant within the police administration. He is set up for a rivalry with the much younger John Chan. Gong Chow is our gem. Hey, how? Gong Lie can bring the police force in. You are the one who is going to give the police force. What are you talking about? You are going to kill me. Hello. I think it's pretty funny for an American watching this movie that a big part of the plot revolves around guns being extremely hard to get. Hey, this is good. Hmm. Wow! <laughs> Hong Kong obviously has strict gun laws, and even the cops have a hard time getting them. Chow ingratiates himself into the gang by selling them guns in a bowling alley and a graveyard. The fact that every bullet is expensive and hard to come by is later played up when the shootout happens. <laughs> City on Fire is a very cool movie and a great vehicle for Chow Young Fat. Ringo Lam met Chow in the 1970s. They released the movie Prison on Fire the same year as City on Fire, and would go on to collaborate a bunch more times. Ringo Lam would also head to the United States in the mid 1990s, releasing movies with Jean Claude Van Damme and Jackie Chan. Ringo Lam's City on Fire deserves to be looked at on its own merits and not just as the inspiration for Reservoir Dogs. And I hope we do it justice tonight. You don't think I'm good? Hmm. Boss, you have to use your old man. Beautiful. I'm going to kill these people. Dad, this is my office. If you can get me to order, you get out! Anyway, before I introduce the panel, let me say, please like this video and subscribe to the Movie Night Extravaganza YouTube channel. Also, we are now monetized, so if you have any pressing questions during this live show, send us a super chat. We are absolutely obligated by international law, human rights law, to answer it. We also have a Patreon, Patreon.com/MovieNightExtra. All of our after parties are available on there forever. Okay, let me introduce the panel. Jandru World, illustrator, book cover artist, comic designer, and artist for Give Them an Argument, co-host of Movie Night Extravaganza and Bad Takes. Dr. Robert Mintz, deputy director for arts and programs at the Asian Art Museum of San Francisco. I, of course, am your Academy Award-nominated host in a supporting role, Forrest Miller. Let's bring out those nominees. Wait, what? What were we nominated for? Um, <laughs> no, it, it's the it's the one that I did for the Oscars. That I still have to change. I got to think of something better, but I haven't yet. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. I'm still gonna make fun of you for it. <laughs> um, so I my favorite part about this movie, I think, is the rivalry between uh, Uncle Lau. Uh, you know, the Inspector Lau, that's his uncle. And that he, like, I mean, he's smart to never say like, hey, this is my nephew. And that's why I care about this one informant so much, uh, like actual nephew, because uncle is obviously used as a title for uh, older men within Hong Kong, or at least within these power structures, because, you know, he gets derisively called uncle by um, right. the other guy, John Chan. And I think my favorite scene in this is the is the very end where he just walks up and just smashes uh, John Chan over the head with a rock and just <laughs> 
walks away from it. <laughs> and it's like his <laughs> his last minute. He's like, look, I this guy looked better than me the entire movie, you know, his police tactics, but he is not going to hit me over the head with a rock. And I'm the one that can do that. <laughs> See, that's a little bit of Confucian virtue there at the end. You know, the old guy wins. <laughs> he has to win. He's the one who's yes. he's chosen to win from the beginning. But it is their rivalry, I think, is really strange because, you know, at, at every turn, at least the way I read the film, you know, that the young cop, the new cop who's going to be, you know, by the book and is going to save money and is going to save time, he's wrong. It's like his approach is just wrong over and over again. So, like, we're set up to, to think, what a dick. Yeah. And that, that and, big uh, scene where they kind of introduce him, too. Like, uh, you see him talking, and he, like, lights up a cigarette, stands up, and right behind him is a no-smoking sign. Right. <laughs> <laughs> just, just, everything yeah, he even, does is wrong. It's in the intro, too. Even, uh, you, yeah. like, you know, he lights a cigarette, stands up, and, like, right behind him is a no-smoking sign. <laughs> well, that's him in his office, right? Like, he, he's able to uh, kind of get away with that kind of stuff. And I, I find it <laughs> fascinating that um, – that he speaks a lot of the time in English, like his commands, yeah. like when he's yeah. like, get out, or when he's saying, um, you know, like like he, he's yelling at him and, and and saying all this different stuff. And it's kind of like, uh, almost like the neoliberalization factor, where it's like the, the new cops that are trying to save money and that, are, you know, don't really care about human lives. And everything is kind of a calculation in this new style of policing, where it's like, well, we could save this many lives if we, you know, get them in the act, whereas uh, we'll put more lives at risk this way. It's kind of these metrics. But I kind of right. find it uh, fascinating that it's definitely like almost an American trope, right? So, or slash like British trope. Like it's... Yeah. um. It, 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 it seems like he's kind of taking a Western style of uh, policing, of speaking. Um, he's more, uh, you know, born in this in this society that's been fully colonized, I guess, and is is trying to do his policing that way. And then it's just wrong every time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and just, you know, very specifically, it's it's British uh, neoliberalism. Uh, so so it's a lot closer to, um, uh, you know, Tony Blair, uh, you know, like a Blairite type of uh, neoliberalism <laughs> versus like an American Clintonite uh, neoliberalism. He's a, he's uh, a, that, he's a, he's a Thatcherite uh, police, police <laughs> inspector. <laughs> yeah, 1987. Right. So yeah, he's Thatcher, Thatcher era, <laughs> yes. which is, which is kind of amazing, but you know, Hong Kong in 1987, English is that's, that's the standard language. That's the language everyone knows. The film's all in Cantonese. And so there's this, you know, kind of, Odd, odd play back and forth, you know, that, that new cop, he's, he's the modern era, you know, he's, he's the direction ostensibly, at least the whole country is going to go. Um, but of course it's and, the wrong direction. It's, yeah. <laughs> and then we look at it today and it's like, oh, Hey, you know, um, English is still around in Hong Kong, but it's not, that's not the direction in which things went. Yeah. And, uh, and that was really up in the air, right? At the, at the time. I mean, it was really up in the air, whether, uh, you know, in 1997, they were inevitably going to give up, uh, Hong Kong and give it back to the Chinese, which was the least, or whether they were going to be able to do the, uh, you know, the old Imperial, uh, you know, Oh, I think we'll just keep this, um, right, right. <laughs> tear up the contract and, you know, just, uh, and like, just mm -hmm. it's yeah. Today it's just absorbed, you know? Yes. <laughs> The places yeah which really is just sad because uh hong kong cinema always fascinates me because of the uh the element of the fact that uh organized crime funded a lot of these movies um mm -hmm. especially the uh, jackie chan films but uh like, like you know if you if you watch jackie chan's chinese films uh now they're they're you know they're very different than what they were back then partly because you know he can't do those stunts anymore you know uh because because uh he you know he's not jumping off top of buildings like he did uh you know back in the uh, 80s right but uh right. uh also like like the subtext of it is very much like that that's um very jingoistic um uh Ch chinese films and like uh you know the these um uh which is also why there was like a big exodus of directors which we kind of touched on in the intro uh so like uh john Wu, ringo lamb uh uh Chow Yun Fat, you know, like people on, on both sides of the camera, you know, came to the States and uh, not too many of them found success, to be honest with you. Um, you know, Sweet Hark sure didn't uh, with, uh, with a double team.
But uh, uh, no, it's, uh, you know, Jackie Chan, I think, is the only one that actually did find success in the States uh, uh, in that uh, Hong Kong exodus. Yeah. I think well, it's interesting. Have... Oh, no, I was just going to say, Hong Kong's kind of like the star of the film, too. You know, when you when, as you're watching them chase each other through the streets and, you know, running one place or another or being like hemmed in in these little rooms, you know, it's like over and over again. Too many people in too tiny a room. And I always think, oh, that's Hong Kong. That's that's the secret of that place. Is it's overly dense, overly packed. And then, you know, you would you wouldn't confuse those city streets with anywhere else in the world. And uh, you know, I think these films, they make that their point. You know, it's like, yeah, they're gonna really yeah. be of the location they come from. You know, unlike what was going on in the 80s in Hollywood, you know, it's like the whole world is your set. Whereas yeah. you know, Hong Kong film is about Hong Kong. Uh, except well, for, so, uh, so um, last last year, I mean, to, just to uh, talk about like the stark difference between Chinese cinema now um, that has incorporated some of these Hong Kong directors and uh, you know, China, like kind of Chinese versus Hong Kong cinema before um, the the battle of the battle at Lake Chan Chanjin or Chanjin, uh, the mm -hmm. movie that was a war film that was just uh, released in 2021 in China, which is their highly, uh, their most highly grossing domestic movie yeah. of all time is uh, the, which the story. Beat of, you know, <laughs> the beat Wolf Warrior too. The Beat But it's, you know, it's, it's a, it's a battle in the Korean war um, that they kind of redramatized and it has all of these, like it has three directors and uh, you know, one of them, uh, Dante Lam is a, is a director that um, was uh, John Woo's assistant director for a lot of those films. And, uh, Tzu Hark, I guess, is another one who was a Hong Kong film director that did uh, Once Upon a Time in China and uh, Zoo Warriors for Magic Mountain. So th these are they've incorporated a lot of these, um, you know, a, a lot of these Hong Kong directors into making, you know, CCP kind of propaganda films, which I mean, you know, we do the same thing in America. We make war movies all the time and it's never, you know, America is never the, the baddie in those movies, you know what I mean? Like, it's always something, it's always a heroic battle like Dunkirk or something where, right. you know, you have uh, the- Top the, Gun Maverick. Yeah, like, <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I'm not, it's not like, I'm not faulting them for it, but it, it is kind of a, no. a stark difference, it feels like, um, in, in you know, what what kind of films uh, were, were made in, in those two yeah. different periods. Yeah, and, and not only that, the, uh, the star actually started out in uh, Hong Kong uh, and was discovered by, uh, 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 Wu Po Ying, yeah, Wu Po Ying, y Yuen, I cannot speak, <laughs> but uh, he's the uh, director and martial arts choreo uh, choreographer who's done uh, The Matrix, uh, Hidden Dragon, Crouching Tiger, um, uh, and a bunch of other great movies from China like uh, 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 w Wing Chun with uh, Michelle Yeoh, um, a Drunken Master, uh, he, he actually directed those, uh, and, and if, he, if he's directing a movie, you know it's not going to be boring. Good. I, I feel like I feel like it, it's also uh, it's also really interesting that this is you know in the U.S. like the year of Michelle Yeoh and uh, right. you know everything everywhere all at once. Very different vibe than um, a lot of the stuff that you know have, has come before it, right? Like it's uh, literally just um, Mar. It's it's like Marvel meets uh, you know those like Marvel kind of uh, um, whatever like multiverse movies meets like one of the most original like uh, you know stories of an immigrant family that you'll see. In, in cinema recently like that's a fully american an americanized project whereas uh you know other actors that have uh been in in that kind of genre of movies have gone on to do things either in the ccp or in you know asian the asian market which is a very which is a different market than you know the american market yeah because tony louis tony lung i think is how you say it um he he was in uh shang chi uh but he was also mm -hmm. in uh, the Killers with John, uh, you know, the John Woo film and right. uh, Red Cliff, which uh, uh, another John Woo film. Hmm. But uh, yeah, you don't see too many of uh, uh, Hong Kong actors really finding that kind of success in the States. Um, so it's very surprising yeah. that he's in that movie. <laughs> um, and then it feels like the 90s are kind of the time when somebody uh, presumably could slash early 2000s because, you know, you have uh, Chow Yun-Fat, like that's his... Um, you know, he really tried in the 90s to break into the American market and couldn't. But uh, going back to, you know, City on Fire, the movie that... I mean, I've seen scenes like, from stuff he's been in. Okay, okay. So, so like, 
uh, they, they kept getting worse. So, so he started off with replacement killers, which is a very by the books, uh, Chow Yun Fat film. And then, like, he did the corruptor with Mark Wahlberg, which is which is uh, a, a step down in quality. And then, I'm, like, by uh, the I'm end, surprised that, I think it's I'm surprised that uh, Mark Wahlberg, uh, you know, decided to go to that set, <laughs> it didn't go up his eye out or anything. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's just a weird movie that that Mark Wahlberg's in a movie where he's playing a a cop in Chinatown in New York, going under, you know, working with um, uh, all an all Chinese squad. So, I mean, I guess that part checks out that he'd be the cop in in Chinatown, but (laughs) he's like he's like the cop that hits the papers that they're like, yeah, this time there was an anti Asian uh, incident in Chinatown. The cop did it. Uh, It was a whole. I, I, I don't know yeah. if you know that backstory. Uh, Mark Wahlberg got in a bunch of trouble at one yep. point. Yep. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Young I do know. Yeah. Gouged like, an Asian man's eye out. Uh, yeah. Which, it was terrible. Yes. But really kind of, you know, you, yeah. You wonder. Makes it, you it, wonder. It makes you it makes you also wonder about the concept of like cancel culture and whether that's yeah. really a real thing. Because that seems like an incident that maybe wouldn't be forgiven. Uh, right. And yet is. I and mean, yet I know he's it's pre that. Yeah. to the cast of uh, Everything Everywhere All at Once. Right. <laughs> <laughs> people forget. You know, years go by, people forget. But like, that's what the, the, uh, the controversies last... section of Wikipedia pages are for. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> the, the, the last uh, American uh, Chow Yun Fat film was Dragon Ball Z. And, and if uh, <laughs> I, I've accidentally watched it twice, I watched it once on purpose. And then I watched it a second time going, oh, I've never seen this movie before. And like halfway through the movie, I'm like, yes, I have. What the hell? This movie's terrible. <laughs> you fooled me into watching it twice. Well, I mean, and that's not just, a, a, you know, um, an Asian market trying to make its way into American market kind of thing. Like, you know, I feel like a lot of the time when we do animated kind of movies as uh, live action, which is like it's popular to do right now. And yeah. they're never good. Or, ba- or barely ever good. No, like <laughs> never this, good. One, this one's so bad. Like you have to watch it to to believe what happens in this film. <laughs> it's- but uh, I so I, I have a clip that I found of um of Chai Yun Fat talking about triads and uh, you know mm. sketchy situations. He refuses to give uh, examples. You know he wouldn't pass a college course or something. I don't think here. But um, this is, this is him trying to talk about uh, triads and their role in funding a lot of these films before, uh, you know, bef- before Hong Kong got absorbed. Lady 但你做電影的時候應該是依翻電影個規則去做,是嗎?即是那個社會是可以用立任何人去做任何嘢,但係一定要好規規矩矩去做一樣嘢。He's yeah, very so... diplomatic, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean you don't want to you don't want to say uh too much, right? Like you, you don't no. want to uh, you know, be like, yeah, well, fuck these triads. They're making life difficult for me. You want to be like, look, I mean, <laughs> as long as you follow the rules, if a triad wants to come and, you know, maybe maybe shoot, you know, maybe pointing a gun at Andy Lau is too much. Maybe that's a, a line, but, uh, you know, nice guys, though. They're really. <laughs> Never bite yeah, the mean, hand yeah. that feeds you. <laughs> exactly. Because remember, uh, we used to have the, uh, well, Hong Kong was actually a hotbed, too. Uh, for for uh, doing international films, because uh, if you remember, that's what gave uh, Jean Claude Van Damme his big break was um, Eastern European uh, uh, mafia people trying to money launder through Hong Kong cinema. They're like, oh, let's get in this too, and then uh, you know, here's this hungry actor coming out to uh, uh, Hong Kong uh, named Jean Claude Van Damme, and uh, 
you know, um, made a name for himself doing B movies there. Uh, Steven Seagal did the same thing in America with uh, uh, Mafia trying to money launder at, uh, for his early films. So uh, Rudy Giuliani brought an end to that. So, you know, thank mm -hmm. you, Rudy Giuliani. Uh, well, so in, in 19, 1996, uh, Ringo Lamb, uh, you know, did a movie with John claude Van Damme, uh, Maximum Risk, I guess it's called, right? That was the movie that I put uh, part of the, yeah, but but like that was that was the first one, and that was his attempt to break into like an American market. Um, yes, was using so that's great, kind of though. a it's like uh, Eastern Europe trying to break into the Hong Kong market because they see money laundering, and then using the, that kind of uh, you know what they've created to break into the American market. It's like a full a global uh, circle. Yeah, well, in '96, you got to remember, uh, like Van Dam had already peaked. Uh, Van Dam was like, um, uh, you know, uh, b basically his his uh, cocaine habit had had ruined Street Fighter uh, the movie um, uh, because because most of the budget went to that and the invisible boat scene, and which was his idea on cocaine. You know, he's just like, listen, I got an idea. Let's have an invisible boat. <laughs> yeah. He's John Coke Van Dam. Yes. Uh, but but like uh, uh, so 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 like he was kind of on his way down as a celebrity. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, Ringo Lamb was trying to do something different. And uh, is it is it an interesting film? I've seen it. Yeah, it's 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 one of one of many Ringo Lamb films about twins. I don't know why this is a uh, thing that uh, he's done multiple films. There's a, he did one with Jackie Chan, two with Jean-Claude Van Damme. Um, there might be more that that I just haven't seen yet, but but that's that's my scorecard. He, so far. I wonder was he a, was he a twin? Does he, he have a, a twin? Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of people named Sounds Lamb in the like movie, so maybe there is. <laughs> I don't know. It doesn't. It doesn't say. Uh, the, the first thing it says is that he he started as an actor and he met uh, Chow Yun Fat in seventy uh, three. That's like where where his story starts on his Wikipedia page. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, I know in a lot of his productions, there's a lot of people named Lamb, and I don't know if they're related or not, uh, but uh, that doesn't matter. <laughs> it's not an uncommon name, you know? No. There's exactly. just a lot of lambs around. But, yes. Okay. And when so, the triads are around, it's uh, it's Silence of the Lambs. Silence. There. there you go. <laughs> oh, that was just bad. <laughs> um so i so i found these clips these are from uh ringo lamb like coming to the united states and th they're kind of doing a press rollout for him and i have a few of these clips so we can talk about them uh you know as they go but this is he's talking about the differences between hong kong and hollywood um you know this era of hong kong mm -hmm. uh and this is this is right before um it gets incorporated back into the ccp so this is like the tail end of the hong kong uh studio system important strand to emerge is the Hong Kong action movie, spearheaded by directors Ringo Lam, Choi Hock and John Woo. Films such as The Killer and A Better Tomorrow were unlike anything that had ever been seen before. The Hong Kong action movie blasted its way to fame in the late 80s, when traditional karate chops, high kicks and Shaolin monks were replaced by shotguns, gangsters and gore. Hong Kong, Hong Kong, Phonetic pacing and high octane editing were the order of the day as the Hong Kong action movie took us to places that Hollywood could only dream of. Kick it into touch. We joined action guru Ringo Lam on the less than glamorous, in fact downright dangerous set of his latest movie Full Alert as he prepared to shoot a tricky underwater robbery scene. He told us what makes the Hong Kong action movie a cut above the rest. We have been now shooting like this for years until now so in fact we get we get used to it we have a limited money limited time but it hang out over the years. like this set i have two divers in there i cannot bring the light inside i can only tell them to bring the existing light source which are, which are two torches and then I have to finish the whole scene. And you can make a film with two torches and no other light. I have one excellent cinematographer. Everybody can bring in many 12Ks. If you don't have money, you have two torches, right? You shoot with two torches, that will give you different feelings. <laughs> Hong Kong action stuff is different from the Hollywood action stuff. 
we have our own style. What is the difference, do you think? <laughs> the, the main difference? You're shooting in a different environment. And you show on the screen. <laughs> when you're in Hong Kong, when you're shooting on the street, uh, it's the policeman. Keep coming and tell you, you should stop. And the traffic we cannot control. They won't let you block the street. The filmmaker has to has to keep moving, keep shooting, and collect the material, whatever. Just go, do it. <laughs> Everybody's nervous. You feel the chaos in the scene. Very chaotic. All this energy and emotions show up on the screen. <laughs>Yeah, so I think that's cool. I think that uh, you know that that really really going in there and capturing. I mean, not that it's necessarily all Hong Kong directors or even action directors that do this, but like the the you know capturing the actual frenetic action when you're kind of uh, chasing your way through the streets because you can't stop in one place, so the cops will kind of get you, and you have a bunch of guys dressed as cops shooting in the middle of the street. Kind of a uh, you know it, it's it's kind of a fascinating uh, environment, I think. Yeah, he definitely know, plays Robert. it up too. You know, I mean, it's like you, you think about that, that, that those scenes, you know, he could only destroy that car once. Yeah. And so, you know, there's a lot of money rest, riding on that car getting totally destroyed on the street in Hong Kong. And it's like, yep, got to catch it that one time. There, there are a couple of spots in the film. I'm, I'm trying to remember where they were, but something really bizarre happens. It's like, what, what, what just walked by, you know? One one and, moment that I found uh, particularly bizarre is after the robbery is done, the guy, uh, you know, I think Tiger is the the name that they gave yeah. him on his on, on his English. Name. So he he runs out and he uh, he shoots the cop car and the cop car somehow blows up. Just blows up, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that single bullet that was the really yeah. good good bullet. Well, see, yeah, I well, was the test loss, though, you know. Well, no, my, my thing was, uh, you know, they, they don't have very many bullets. They're not really training yeah. that hard to use guns. So they've actually gotten themselves to aim so well that they know the exact point that you yes. have to hit a, a cop car to blow it up. Um, <laughs> but like a lot of the scenes in this, I mean, especially like the robbery scenes and when they're running through the streets and like a lot of this movie, uh, there's, they're clearly filming in places where people are just kind of hanging out and like doing their yeah. shopping and stuff. Um, and they're not closing off the streets, like, which I mean, adds to it because it really is. He's just running through Hong Kong. So like, it makes a lot of sense, but like you ha you have to think if he's not closing down the streets, those are just like people that are, <laughs> you know, catching well, in the Which background. is why everybody in this movie like looks at Chow Yun Fat, like, wait, wait, is that the guy? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You see that like, like, yeah, every single time he's just like hanging out on the street. Like you just see people like walk and do like his double take and look at him. <laughs> <laughs> it is hilarious because it keeps happening through the entirety of the movie. It's it's like my you know one of my favorite parts. To just just like yeah yeah that's Chelian fat. Well, <laughs> and then comparing it to something like uh, Reservoir Dogs and you know the scenes where they show the robbery happening, they can very clearly close that street. Like yeah. every every person within those scenes is somebody that Tarantino wants there. Um, you never see people like turn around and go, oh Harvey Keitel. <laughs> you're you're, uh, you're running out of out of a bank holding a guy covered in blood like huh this, this is a this is an odd day <laughs> harvey is everything okay <laughs> <laughs> um but in this you know I, I don't know i i think um i think the big payoff or the humorous payoff for me in this is uh the whole movie they're like very concerned about getting enough bullets like yeah. that's that is such a big plot point of this movie, which you know, I mean, for for somebody sitting in America that you know hasn't been to a country where there's very strict gun laws, um, especially like yeah, you know, and just you know, a... keep this in perspective. There was a uh, school shooting today, um, followed, uh, and my yeah. child had to deal with a lockdown at a uh, you know uh, because uh, somebody swatted their school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so thinking about 
that versus this movie where even the cops seem to have a lot of trouble getting guns and getting enough bullets to like sell in a you know an undercover yeah. arms deal like you start to realize like oh this is like a, a very different situation but the payoff in the end is that nobody gives a fuck about how many bullets they use uh you know when they finally collect them all in the um big shootout scene they're just wasting bullets like crazy and that was uh <laughs> Yeah, it's like all, all of that planning goes, you know, out the window once you decide, oh, let's just shoot a lot. And, yeah. <laughs> uh, kind of, you know, pepper the wall with little holes. Not and that's that the, um, good. I mean, I mean, that's kind of every, every heist movie. I think that for me, at least, that's the, uh, the part of it that's fun to watch is like every, every time you watch a heist movie, it's like, um, so meticulously planned and everything. And, you know, you wait till that last moment. And then, of course, everything goes wrong and everyone just starts shooting each other. And that's right. the end every time. And you're like, you know, preparation be damned, I guess. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, what's that Mike Tyson quote? Uh, you know, planning goes out the window as soon as he gets punched in the face. <laughs> <laughs> so but, uh, he so said he, that about marriage counseling. Yeah. So he goes, <laughs> oh, damn. He, uh, <laughs> he, he goes on in this uh, clip that we were talking about, you know, playing up the differences between Hollywood and Hong Kong. And, uh, you know, it, it, like I didn't put it together at first, but like obviously the reason that he leaves Hong Kong in the mid 90s is the fact that they're about to get absorbed into the CCP, which it feels like maybe half the directors left to try to make it in the United States or half the actors like him and yeah. Chow and Matt left at the same time. And then the other half uh, kind of stay to see what happens, which is interesting moment, I think. So. Uh, the place I was raised, uh, people just simply call it black spot, right? Black spot means lots of violence around there. I didn't participate in any violence, but I heard, I saw so much of violence. When people talk about violence, I don't know if it's the content or the context. If they say explosion of the head, too much blood coming from the wound, that's the reality. Reality or not, it's a winning formula that Hollywood has been eager to snap up. Following in the footsteps of action director John Woo, Lam made the Tinseltown trip to make the all-kicking, all-punishing Jean-Claude Van Damme vehicle maximum risk. Unlike Woo, though, Lam wasn't tempted to stay. Sometimes... <laughs> You might easily get spoiled if you have too much money. In Hollywood, they, they it takes a long time to uh, dress up for one, one setup mm -hmm. and run through the whole master. They have plenty of footage and the Hong Kong filmmaker, in order to save time, save money, we normally don't do too many master shots, right? So we will do it shot by shot in order to save the footage. And because of this, we have much more uh, uh, different angle to cover the same scene. <laughs> that uh, what the Hollywood people buy. <laughs> when I make picture, I feel like I have one Chinese eye, one Western eye. My mentality, in fact, is half and half. And the changeover in Hong Kong, to a certain extent, I, I prepare. It's difficult for me to uh, foresee what other changes are with the sensor board. Yeah. And I will, I will always try to do my best to see the hangover more in a positive way. I don't care whatever government, whatever management it is, they won't kick me out. I will stay. 
I love Hong Kong. 入边嘅匪徒听住，如果再唔逃，我哋系攻入嚟啦！投降，投你阿妈，放过！啊、he certainly did love Hong Kong. His very last film that came out after he passed away was a uh, uh, film where eight directors did short films about Hong Kong. Um, and and Hong Kong really is another character in in City on Fire. Like it, it it feels like I mean it's a city that's lived in, and you don't really it's it's hard to capture that with a lot of uh, movies. You know, like a lot of movies right. try to do it with L.A. I guess here and like uh, don't really. It's not the same, you know. Yeah, it's just not. But I I think it has a lot to do with density. You know, just that that really close packed. You know, it's like every every. Strata of society, every way of living your life, they're all always there all the time, and so you know you can have the the high end jewelry store and you know family on the street and the police and the thieves and everybody just you know packed packed so closely together. And this movie really captures that in a yeah. pretty uh, incredible way. Um, I mean, you know, you kind of have to stop it and like. Look at the scenes that they paint because it just—it's uh, so fast-paced. Whenever they're in like yeah. uh, any any public place, um, I, I like that they do the the shot that I don't know if it comes from something else and then um, has been copied from this or from other things. But there's a shot where he goes to the airport and it does the uh, the round shot around him um, that I feel like is a is a really uh, people love doing that when someone runs to the airport and they check the uh, you know the airport board and like the plane's already leaving and they do the. This like the spin, like to yeah. try to capture the, the emotionality of the chaos of an airport. Like he did a good job with that. Um, I think in this, um, I love the line though that he says in this, where he says, "I have one uh, Western eye and one Chinese eye," and yeah. he's like, and they're always, uh, you know, looking. And you know, I, of course, that's uh, it, when when you're looking at censor boards or you know any any kind of, I mean, the MPAA or you know the Chinese censor board, which has got to be <laughs> but, you know, a lot more rigorous. Um, you know, having having those two eyes and, and and looking at those styles of filmmaking as completely different things, but trying to kind of synthesize that um, for an international audience. I think he does a really good job of that. I mean, just the fact that Tarantino can watch this and then be inspired to you know to make uh, Reservoir Dogs. Yeah. So, can I ask you? You know, we we keep talking about the same characters, and you see these characters over and over in the movie. And then there's Rose and Lily. What were their names? Hung. Hung is his his yeah. Hung like and, uh, fiance, not fiance, who disappears, and uh, and her friend, who's I guess his friend too. Um, but they're such one dimensional characters. Like, why are they even there? I mean, I guess they they humanize Chow a little bit. But. Yeah. It's it's weird because uh, I mean I've watched a lot of uh, Hong Kong uh, cinema and uh, there really aren't good roles for women. Uh, you know, yeah. with the rare exception with Michelle Yeoh and uh, Cynthia Rothrock, who who uh, went out there and did a bunch of uh, Hong Kong films. Um, she, she's an American. If if you're not familiar with her, uh, she's an American martial artist. Um, uh, in fact, did Yes, Madam with Michelle Yeoh. Uh, but but uh, in general, like like uh, honestly. These are um, uh, well-defined characters compared to most <laughs> other uh, female characters in other films that I've seen. Um, you, know, you even know, like, uh, you know, you even know what their pee smells like. You know, it's uh... this is true. <laughs> this is, I, I know so much more about them than I thought I ever would. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I don't know. And it's kind of almost a, it's a misogynistic uh, depiction of a fiance for him because she's just like, Oh, I'll just go off with this uh, businessman that I don't even like. Yeah. And, uh, and he's like chasing after her. And then he, she like ends up in fucking Hawaii and doesn't even like matter for the rest of it. She's just there for the first half. He doesn't seem to particularly like her until yeah. she's like, Oh, I'm leaving. And he's like, no, 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 wait, wait, wait. I think it's just a, a way for, um, Chowing fat to kind of show another side of him, like a more tender slash, uh, slightly rapey side, I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's uh, almost like fridging somebody, you know. It's, it's she's only there for the development of the uh, 
uh, of the lead character, which this is a meaty role for Chow Young Fat. Usually, like like he's trying to be like uh, the Joe Shishido um, action movies in the sixties, you know, fifties and sixties uh, from Japan. You know, the too cool for school guy who just walks in, right. doesn't really say anything, kills a bunch of people, and walks away. Um, and and uh, uh, so, but this this role right here, you actually get to see him. Uh, there's a lot of personality to him in this that that you don't see in other films. And no personality to any of the female characters. Yeah, <laughs> yeah likes just there guys with him. likes guys with money, likes uh, likes vacations. We know that. Like shopping, he's like, oh, just go shopping. Yeah. So you, you know, <laughs> That's it's, like, it's like a oh. um, a rap lyric almost like, from the eighties. Well, I mean, you know, I guess I, the I guess one. Back to, well, to the, young the MCs, one thing. Uh, the one thing kind of saving it, I guess, is that he's kind of an undercover cop, which, I mean, you do see it in, like, a lot of these movies, whether it's, like, uh, like uh, Donnie Brasco, right? Like, the kind of um, character that has a family on the side, which, you, like, I don't know why these undercover cops keep having, like, a family or, like, a fiancé on the side. Like, you, you know that you're, you know, going to have to go underground and not be able to see them or whatever and not be able to explain all this stuff. But, um, you know, it, I guess it kind of makes sense that, like he'd find like a very superficial i mean she's like a student or something like she's younger than him right. so she he'd find like a very superficial kind of person to like you know try to be in a relationship with since he's not really able to tether his own identity to himself i guess um so that's like the one uh, that's the one saving grace of it that uh you know he has to have the secondary life and it's like you almost forget about the life they, they just want to make it so that he has something going on in his like regular named yeah. life so that when he goes underground he can like half talk about it with uh with tiger whose wife left him and was you know he got cucked by his wife and took the kids or something like <laughs> that's a whole nother story that just gets referenced he's like i don't know my wife left me <laughs> i'm a divorced guy now <laughs> see it's all just yeah, a setup good. you know it's a setup for uh for uh what's his name lao the the his uncle to find his wallet in the car <laughs> and give away the address of where they're hiding out you know it's like yeah okay so his girlfriend's picture there has to be a reason he has a picture well he has a picture because he has a girlfriend okay so we got to write a girlfriend into the movie <laughs> so that he has a picture there so that tiger doesn't like actually search through his wallet find and it. uh and also for the for the one scene where he shows his uncle the picture of the girlfriend and yep. he's like oh and he's like she cooks she she knows how to cook and she cleans and uh and he's like and her piece like, smells Ding. that's <laughs> yeah. some good like, some bad you know he's like you know uh you know good looks aren't everything he's like no she cooks and cleans for me too you know <laughs> this is this is the this is the uh you know the the, the perfect wife character but not really because she'd left him for a businessman these are all just divorced thieves I, i'd like to see this a movie true. about like <laughs> divorced thieves <the> movie <laughs> stevie oh. stevie says in chat crouching tiger hidden divorced dad <laughs> <laughs> oh. um but yeah like it's it's not a good depiction of uh female characters here at all definitely uh the the other character is like something out of like a, a shakespeare uh, like a shakespearean play where it's just like the waiting woman or something that's like uh you know just like she's, his... she's just there for a purpose yeah <laughs> like she she is there but you never you know nothing about her at all and uh but you know it, it's kind of curious i think about about quentin tarantino's movies and uh he's much better at giving women at times really you know deeply dimensioned I mean, characters now but yeah. like i mean the famous yeah. thing about reservoir dogs is that they're like the only per the only woman in the and i watched reservoir dogs again yesterday yeah. to get ready for this conversation like of course the movie inspired by that uh he strips out all of that and the one female character in the whole movie is just the the woman with a baby in the car that uh right. you know mr <laughs> orange tries to pull her out of the car and he shoots mr Arn like that's the yeah. one uh and of course, you know, because it's America, she has a gun right there. <laughs> she right. pulls out and <laughs> plenty of bullets. That's the way it is. <laughs> she, she, she like shot him and then gave him some bullets. <laughs> and then oh. he's like, "Oh, I'll just shoot her back." And he's like, "Okay, I'm watching an American movie again. I I feel I feel far more uh, comfortable with this subject matter than." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, and uh, really. Uh, uh, Pulp Fiction, which I also watched recently, you know, the, 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 there are female characters in it, but they're very shallow. Um, 
uh, you know, ex, you know, Uma Thurman's character is very thinly written. It's her performance yeah. that makes it work. It's not the writing. Um, yeah. It, it, it's yeah, I mean, I, I, that, point taken for that, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, the only other female character that's that's really in it is uh, um, the uh, the woman that's uh, uh, hooked up with um, uh, Bruce Willis, and she's absolutely obnoxious uh, and, and is, <laughs> is like, "You would punch me in my little pot belly." Um, the the other no the other female character is the weird uh, junkies junkie that lives with the uh, yeah the, yeah she's uh, on Star Trek now yep. yeah <laughs> she, she's on Picard she she's great but again not not a lot of depth to any of these women um, it's it's all the actresses who you know uh, uh, you know honestly you know uh, kudos to to uh, Uma Thurman for making that work because. Uh, it's her chemistry with John Travolta that that basically sells the whole thing and uh, would have completely fallen apart without that because she's fairly thin, uh, thinly written, um, you know, compared to everybody else. But I mean, then you go, you know, to Kill Bill with him using Uma Thurman as his muse. And, you know, that's like, one. yeah, of I, probably think, I think, you, of... you know, Jackie Brown using uh, uh, Elmore Leonard was a good stepping stone to kind of get over that. Uh, you know, he had a crutch of uh, Elmore Leonard's great book which is way better than the movie uh which is weird because usually elmore Leonard movies are better than the books but uh the books. <laughs> and i love the books so i have i have tarantino uh this is his justification for uh somebody said admits to stealing the idea that was like the youtube video yeah. title but i don't i don't think that that's necessarily what he's doing here but i find it interesting that he uh met and talked to ringo lamb about it bad or indifferent reservoir dogs didn't really exist before i did it there's a whole story about this hong kong movie city on fire if you've ever seen city on fire it's very very different from my movie the section that they say i took i did take from it all right absolutely i took from it but it's a very different movie they actually talked to the director ringo lamb he goes wow tarantino took the last 10 minutes of my movie and made an entire movie about it <laughs> Well, that's a fucking different movie. That's very, very different. But the point being, though, is what I had to say and my kind of idea of crime films and my idea of dialogue, you know, there was Barry Levinson and Tin Men and there was Goodfellas and there was all kinds of the David Mamet stuff. All that stuff existed. That was sort of like Reservoir Dogs, but it wasn't Reservoir Dogs. It, it didn't have this aesthetic that I'd been having. It was a scene. It was a mood for only a little bit or a section of the movie. But it was never the whole enchilada. Yeah, it's just like what uh, uh, Pablo Picasso did in his painting, the um, uh, young ladies of Avignona. However, you say that, I don't know how to say it. I've never been All able right. to well, say Avignon. Yeah, them. <laughs> you fit this in. You, you did it. You did yes. it. You uh, you brought yes. it up. <laughs> and, and what he did is he actually took uh, you know part of the composition from El Greco's um, uh, what is it, the Seventh Sign or something like that. That's um, uh, where, where it's got, uh, uh, here, hold on. I'm pulling it up right now. Where is it? Uh, okay. You know, as an art historian, this is just painful. Can I just tell you this? Fortunately, the class Andrew took with me did not involve Picasso or El Greco. <laughs> no, it was, was entirely uh, it was no. It's not about those things, but no, it was opening of the fifth seal by El Greco, uh, which which go. has uh, yeah. you know uh, several women standing in the background in the same pose that Picasso mm -hmm. used in, in the painting, but Picasso changing the the uh, this style. Is the Picasso one, yeah, yeah, which is a famous Cubist painting, and then uh, yeah, he took it from um, you know opening of the fifth seal by uh, El Greco, and um, uh, you know there, there's there's five women in the same pose just in like the corner. So it's like he cropped it and painted it in a different style. And that's exactly what he, uh, what Tarantino did. He cropped uh, City on Fire and then made it into a different genre. See, all of that, just to make the point about Tarantino, I feel like, I feel like you could have done that in a way less meandering kind of way. <laughs> it I made used me look up El Greco. Art history, you know. <laughs> it's just um, impressive. 
<laughs> but yeah, I mean, it, it's taking the last 10 minutes of this movie and really, really extending it into, you know, Tarantino's uh, distinct style, which I mean, is more of a writing slash dialogue thing, which kind of makes it funny that he wasn't originally good at writing female characters because he is really good at writing male characters. And like, uh, it, it's been so um, like, you know, homaged and like, uh, you know, copied and parodied at this point, just the uh, the whole, I mean, just from the first scene, right? Like, they're all talking about uh, Madonna's like a virgin and like big dicks or whatever, and just having a conversation about that way more, I think, on the nose than most conversations uh, about a bunch of guys to be having <laughs> at a diner, but still like, um... yeah, I mean, you're too young to remember this, but when Pulp Fiction came out, I, like it was, it was like a revelation because it was like, people could see themselves in, in uh, his films in a way that they couldn't before, uh, which, which is uh, interesting, uh, uh, you know, because of things like that diner scene, because of, uh, you know, scenes from Pulp Fiction where they're, where they're having those uh, discussions. We have a, a comment from a different side of Chow Yun Fat. Check out Love in a yeah. Fallen City and the story of Wu Viet, which he did before City on Fire. They were both directed by Anne, uh who... Um, yeah, so I'm not I, I, familiar with those to be honest with you. Yeah, I haven't. Uh, I, I thought he's I thought he started out with uh, like I guess it was the first famous movie that he did was with John Woo, and it was uh, yeah, I mean, you know, he did Tiger on the Beat before this too, which uh, famously has a uh, chainsaw fight. <laughs> he was also trying to break out as like a TV star, I guess, like doing Hong Kong like television kind of soaps, which feels like um when you look at like this this movie or something like that um it, it really you, you could see how like chi like hong kong soaps would kind of go right like there's so yeah. much of this that kind of feels um like the action movie genre that kind of feels almost like cribbed from something you could do from there but like just the scenes where he's you know in his uh, girlfriend's apartment and she's like i'm gonna leave you for this guy and then he gets to the airport and like it spins around and like like those kinds of scenes almost feel cribbed out of a soap opera more than they which is probably why the female characters don't quite feel uh lived in or you know like like um fleshed out <laughs> yeah uh but but he, he also uh like if you watch a better tomorrow and a better tomorrow too you can kind of see him becoming the action star because uh, one thing we haven't mentioned is just how famous John, uh, you know, Chow Yun Fat was. Uh, because like when he changed his hair in like the uh, late '80s, early '90s, every man in China would uh, get the same haircut. It was like you know uh, the the only comparison we have is is uh, Jennifer Aniston's The Rachel or whatever that uh, that was in the, the late '90s. <laughs> and we haven't had a haircut like that. So, you know, an actor with a Associated or uh, or Bruce Willis and everyone deciding, you know what? Maybe it's okay to be bald. Bald, yeah, yes. yeah. <laughs> um, well, I know that's your your uh, hero. Yeah, that's my hero. I'm, I'm you know I'm rocking the now I have a little hair Bruce growing. Bruce Willis. <laughs> <laughs> you know that's I'm why I say the of Bruce Willis. That's why I say uh, what you talking about, Willis. You know that's my <laughs> <laughs> that's my catchphrase. <laughs> um, but yeah, um. We we usually do uh we usually pull one liners, but since Christina isn't here, we don't we don't have one liners tonight. Kinda... Yeah, yeah. I feel I feel oddly naked without them now because because it's <laughs> been uh we were, we were commenting uh before we came on like I it's been so long since it's been just uh forced me and a guest. <laughs> yeah, we the the first few uh the first few like whatever the first um like six months or something of the show it was me and Andy co-hosting. And then we started slowly adding like co-hosts and like getting a format down. And uh, Conan, who usually co-hosts with us, is recording a bunch of uh, music right now, which is kind of really cool. And he's keeps sending us cool studio music that he's like working on. Yeah, he, he's working with the uh, producer of um, the Melvins and Tool, so you know it's it's kind of a big deal huh. uh, producer that he's working with. So you know it's like he is a real life rock star. You know, not just <laughs> not just playing one on TV. That's good. That makes you a two-legged stool. That makes this really difficult, doesn't it? <laughs> you know, like you need your third leg just to kind of. Well, we have a fourth leg too. She has. Oh, a... really? Yeah, she's sick. She got yeah last minute had to cancel. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah. That's what happens here in our world today. Um, it's constant. People just drop like that. So. And she was the one who's supposed to be doing the uh, one-liner. So, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> if, if uh, we had any kind of warning, we could have uh, maybe, you know, Force and I could have faked it ourselves. But, 
but um but i'm gonna I have, I have one more clip we can comment on about uh you know the, the reservoir dogs connection and then andy if you want to go to plugs after that okay um Hello, I'm Ringo Lam. Fucking dirty idol. In America, I like, uh, like, uh, I said French connection. I like Godfather, so I like Coppola a lot. I like uh, Martin Scorsese, like the taxi driver. I still like the, his earliest works. Inference. So much influence on me. I saw uh, Wrestleman Dog. Definitely, that is a very good movie. If he, you know, once he watched uh, City on Fire, he got the story concept or the character concept. Mm -hmm. No big deal. Very natural. But he, in that movie, Wrestleman Dog, it's not a copy. He did the movie actually something different. Even the style is different. I would say he is a very smart guy, very talented. He has a different treatment different presentation to play out, even if uh, there's a scene you know, taken from the Chinese cinema. He has a way to make it, the presentation different, the style different. Quentin Tarantino, you look at his uh, style, the tempo only. The tempo is not the American tempo. The American tempo is very fast, fast cut. Very fast, very good cut, of course, right? Quentin Tarantino, he is very good in play out scenes. Every individual scenes, he pays attention, he played good. The character played good. No rush. Uh, China movie, Hong Kong movie, American movie. Uh, the bottom line to make a good movie. Yes, immediately you look at it, it's very, very similar to City on Fire. But there's also elements of the taking of Pelham 1, 2, 3. There's elements of uh, Stanley Kubrick's The Killing. A lot of people claim that, oh, you know, Tarantino's ripping off a Hong Kong movie or he's ripping off this. And he's not. I think he's taking elements. He looks so right. <laughs> but he, he's working them around in his own... Oh, my. City on Fire was rega highly regarded in Hong Kong, but I think after Reservoir Dogs, a lot more people went back and looked at it again. True that. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Just like us, no. <laughs> um, I know, I, so, so I guess the last thing, uh, you know, in, in our going through it that I really want to talk about is that Mexican standoff scene. Uh, and and those final moments, which is you know the part of it that uh, Tarantino lifted, and of course, um, I think if you go to the, there's a lot more space in Tarantino's Mexican standoff, obviously because yeah, it's, it's supposed it's very to be close. John Woo's the killer uh, when they have their Mexican standoff in that church, but that's uh, you know, uh, you can also say he took from there. Well, I mean, but that that movie is even. Um, like that church scene, they're not doing the same kind of standoff where it's the three gangsters doing the one, two, three, right? Like it's that one's more of a uh, final shootout with police, right? Uh, no, there's a, there's a Mexican standoff because at one point you're not quite sure because um, it is it is a cop 
a criminal who's who's uh, being hunted by other criminals. Yeah. And you know the 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 criminals, and you're not quite sure where everybody's uh, loyalties are, are uh, necessarily falling down. And that's the crux of the film. Is is these these uh, you know those two the cop and the uh, the criminal and their relationships. So so it's uh, you know, uh, but the 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 spacing you know because because it isn't a much bigger space. You know, it's in a church versus uh, this film, which is in like you know this tiny room. Yeah. So the tiny room part of it, I think. Uh even though they're both in kind of a warehouse makes it a little bit different. Also, um, obviously Tarantino plays up. I mean, he kind of, uh, instead of, I, I like that instead of it being like the uncle is the, um, you know, the uncle Lao and, uh, you know, like Chow, like Ku Chow characters are, you know, uncle and um, like, he does the same thing I think with nice guy, Eddie and with uh, Joe in reservoir dogs, where it's like that relationship between them, which, you know, kind of uh, mirrors, I guess the relationship that, uh, Mr. White gets with uh, Mr. Pink and that kind of father and son bond almost. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Although my one complaint though, is like, uh, it doesn't quite seem like uh Harvey Keitel's Mr. White would be so loyal to, um, uh, <laughs> to, 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 to Mr. Orange the, the way he is. Um, no, but they, and, uh, they bonded. You they know? did, but not, not, to, not like this movie where, where they really, you know, they, they, they truly, you know, went through hell on this movie. Uh, and you get to see them slowly build that relationship. Where well, but just, I mean, the thing is that that's that's why it's interesting that Tarantino only takes like the last ten minutes because yeah. presumably they go through hell, but you just don't see that on screen in Reservoir Dogs. Whereas this movie uh, plays up the hell that they go through, um, and yeah. you know, you, like like in this movie, you really feel uh, his relationships around him and everything that he's going through uh, for the reason that um, you know he's you're kind of watching it the entire time. Whereas I think it, it makes it uh, very different that in, um, you know, in, in, in Reservoir Dogs, you, you never see that part of it, which is the whole point. Yeah. And also, I love the fact that you never see the robbery. But, but if you, uh, and you realize that they describe the robbery from this movie. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Point by point. <laughs> so they, he stole they, that they actually, uh, Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> No, it's like it's it's five guys watching uh you know five guys on acid watching City on Fire and they're like wow that was totally we did that right like that was a... <laughs> pretty much <laughs> like why am I bleeding oh man we must have really gone through the shutout <laughs> <laughs> but Andy you want to do the plugs uh sure uh you're watching us right now on YouTube so please do the YouTube things like comment subscribe hit that bell and of course. You know, uh, the big ask is to watch our video to the end uh, because you get to hear a great Kona Neutron song and that helps us have other movie fans find what we do. Um, we are also on uh, Twitch, so please do the Twitch things. Throw us a sub. If uh, you happen to have an Amazon Prime account, you can subscribe to our channel for free and that actually uh, helps us out, uh, which, uh, you know, thank you for everybody who does that. Um, we, uh, do have a audio version of the podcast, uh, which is great if you want to be doing other things than sitting here staring at our faces, uh, you know, washing dishes, driving a car. I do not recommend watching us while you drive a car, but you can do other things while you're listening, uh, all through our audio version of the podcast. The only downside is we don't subtitle our, uh, foreign language pieces. Sorry. Um, we do have, uh. Uh, we are on other social media websites. If you want to get more of us, we're on Twitter, we're on Facebook, and we're on Instagram. So please find us to follow us there. Find out what we're doing next, uh, which I forgot to look into the future to see what we're doing. Uh, <laughs> so I can't give you a tease now. But, uh, uh, okay, you know, find out. Uh, we have a Twitter community, um, uh, which I have not been able to uh, do polls because I've been just busy doing other things. Uh, and I hate that because I really want to, I really like doing the polls and I really want to put the work into it. It's, it's ironic that you're doing other things and then uh, <laughs> give them an argument. It hasn't really been, you know. Oh, yeah. But, you know, I watched four hours of a Haas podcast uh, broadcast uh, for, for, for Ben, um, which I'm still suffering from because mm-hmm. nobody <laughs> nobody should ever have to do that. Uh, uh, anyways. <laughs> uh, please join us on Patreon. Uh, that that helps us out and gives you access to our after parties. And the beauty of our uh, of that is um, our after parties may be uh, temporary online for the public, but they live on forever in the uh, Patreon. You get to after party forever. Yep. 
exactly. Now, Conan Neutron's not here, but I did want to shout out. Um, he is recording an album, but you can still get his other music at uh, neutronfriends.bandcamp.com. Uh, so please go there, check it out. Um, check out some back episodes of uh, uh, Conan Neutron's uh, uh, Protonic Reversal, which um, uh, he recently had um, uh, Diana, uh, Donna Diane from uh, Juno, uh, who is uh, one of the performers at Catterwall. So you can, uh, you know, get psyched to hear some of uh, her music as well as Conan's uh, and uh, Action Chief, which is his other brand, uh, both playing at Catterwall uh, coming up in May. So uh, look forward to that. Get your tickets uh, if, if you can make it out to the uh, Twin Cities. And, um, you know, he has a Patreon, too, if you really want to help him out. Uh, Christina is also not here. I want to also shout out her coffee. Um, you know, so please buy her a coffee. Tell her to get well soon. We, we all miss her. So, uh, <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, it's uh, kofi uh, dot com slash uh, cosmopolitics. So uh, please um, buy her a coffee. And uh, yeah, I think that's uh, everything else except uh, we're right up to. Um, Robert, is there anything you want to be plugging? Anything happening at the Asian Art Museum that uh, people should know about? What are we doing? Uh, <laughs> it's San Francisco. We're always doing something fun. Um, tomorrow, we open Beyond Bollywood, an exploration of dance in South Asia. And mm. uh, it's a load of fun. Everybody loves right. Bollywood film. Yeah. It's beyond that. So <laughs> just trust me. It's beyond that. It's, it's, fabulous. <laughs> it's on, it, on view through, what, July 12th. So, and you do some online stuff too uh, on occasion there too, right? Don't we? I think we do. I think. Yeah. I think. I mean, yeah. we have an ongoing virtual virtual museum program, so there's always an opportunity to go to our website, asianart.org. That's the place where we have all of our content available. Um, but these days, in this post-pandemic era, I encourage people to show up. Just like get yes. out of your house, put on Absolutely. pants, go out there. And uh, the museum is a great place to go because it's pretty big. Uh, so you don't have to be close to anybody. Hmm. You know, just go wander <laughs> around. Um, if it's you not like, it's to not be. like Hong Kong where you are. Uh... This is true. I'm terrified to go to Hong Kong. You know, it's like, oh, it's going to be, it's gonna be <laughs> sick in a heartbeat. Um, but it's. New York used know. to be like that, but not anymore. No, I was just in New York last weekend and it was, it was so spacious and empty i thought oh something's changed so <laughs> yeah during uh, except, except during the pandemic the subway, that's the same. <laughs> yes well during the during the pandemic i lived 90 minutes from the city and uh my my brother was living you know my brother goes on and off to the city because his girlfriend lives in brooklyn and uh it kind of emptied out and everyone kind of started fleeing up here which i was like oh i don't do uh -oh. that come on <laughs> just stay just stay down there guys like <laughs> It's yeah, really and true. And it's part of Massachusetts too. Um, we, we got a lot of uh, a lot of tourists uh, coming, you know, staying. Um, I, yeah, I used to they, 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 they always they always come as tourists, and then they're like, "Wow, it's so nice here. I don't really have to go back to the office uh, for a little while. Why don't I just, you know, rent an apartment?" And then you get landlords, greedy or, or landlords, trying to do like yeah. city prices. <laughs> That's the or, or try buying a place oh. uh, while, while uh, you know this is all happening because uh, everybody's coming up here because you know it's much better than New York. Um, yeah, and uh, <laughs> yeah, we, we probably overpaid for the place we have, but I'm uh, very happy with it. So you know, because I yeah, have this just, little uh, dungeon. <laughs> <laughs> Your podcasting dungeon—they're like they're like oh you know it's going to be a couple extra thousand dollars, but you get a podcasting dungeon, so uh, you know. But uh, Robert, do you have any final thoughts on this movie? Anything we didn't uh, get to? Or Anything any, uh... didn't get to in this movie. Uh, no. Do I have any final thoughts on this movie? No, you guys made me watch it, which was great. I would probably never have watched this film. Um, just because, I mean, it's it's kind of of its moment, that late 80s moment. And I don't know that I would have gone back to look at it. But it's remarkably good. I mean, it's it's the kind of film you can just, it's, it's like, you know, it's tasty and short. Yeah. And... Full, you know, it never slows down. Right in the middle, he runs through the city, and you know, it's like, okay, that's exhausting. Uh, but it's <laughs> back it's, to the future on a tour truck. Exactly. <laughs> but it's truly, you know, by the end, it's like, okay, that movie was pretty satisfying. 
you know, it, it, it does everything it needs to do. And even though it's very predictable, it's like, it, it takes you on that sort of ride, which. And it, it's it, like, it's even, even if it's predictable, like, I feel like the way that they do things that, I mean, we've kind of seen happen a lot in Hollywood now because of Reservoir Dogs, like, right, you know, right. like the Mexican standoff in really close quarters, which isn't ever how it happens in uh, whatever. I think that it's, uh, it's different enough that it, it works out well. You're like, oh shit, that's where that came from. Like, yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like, it, it lays out things that, you know, you've seen, but it's like, oh. Their origins lie back there, and uh, and I think that that point your clip made of you know Hollywood wanted it. They wanted that kind of energy and frenetic sort of you know nonstop motion, whether it's you know blowing stuff up and killing each other or just just constantly moving. That was desirable. It's like yeah, every- and that's the that's the one eye on China, one eye on the West kind of thing. I like that quote yeah. a lot that he said yeah. uh, during that. Um, but uh, Andy, final thoughts on this? Um, I'm glad we were able to cover this movie because uh, I quite enjoy it. Um, I do have a, a big love for Hong Kong cinema of this era. Um, it reminds me very much of the Japanese war of the uh, 50s and 60s. Uh, and you can it, it's great because uh, you know which we barely touched on on this show, um, but but you can actually draw a straight line from that because uh, Hong Kong wasn't just you know, popular on this island, you know, it was actually all throughout, uh, you know, that part of Asia. So, so Korea, Japan, were also watching these Hong Kong films. Yeah. It's like Uh, the Asian market was in the eighties and nineties considered a different uh, market completely than the American market, which clearly, I mean, uh, you know, Chow Young Fat wanted to break into the American market and kind of had to do it um, first in Hong Kong with a better tomorrow. And then this, um, and then the Asian market as a whole with like, you know, his next couple of movies and then the American market. And it's like um, to expand yourself out, I guess, to break away from uh, Hong Kong at this moment. Yeah, I just I just wish uh, he had better films because, God, those are some awful <laughs> films he did in America. Uh, I just rewatched The Corrupter and, uh, I was just, you know, um, uh, he's great in it. And, and there's lots of great, you know, single performances. But like, honestly, that movie is just not good um and, and uh but like uh that's because like like i don't think they quite knew that he had the range that uh he shows in this particular film because he is that cool guy who walks in with a gun and, and uh can shoot up a place but also um he's he's funny he's charming he's got this this charisma and uh you don't really get to see that in uh too many other things so uh this, this is a, a nice uh, th- film because of uh, the range that he shows. Because I, I know earlier he did do some uh, uh, romance movies I haven't seen. Uh, I, I, I still haven't uh, seen Tiger on the Beat. But it has a chainsaw fight. It ends with a chainsaw <laughs> fight. <laughs> you need to know any more about this movie. <laughs> All right. Well, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree with that. And I don't think I would have... Uh seen this either if it wasn't for you know us doing this episode what i'm glad i did uh robert thanks for uh coming on with us hey so, anytime uh next week we're gonna be covering rocky balboa that's our <laughs> next uh that, that should be a that should be an interesting episode and it's be interesting uh you know watch back to back but you know i think that's it for uh for this week this is a fun episode